airplane is an annual, so I've had the, an empty hangar for about a week or two, so I figured I'd talk a little bit about um, what I use for my videography and photography. I get asked a lot what kind of camera I use, what kind of lenses I use, so I figured I'd, I'd take the time and, and kind of show you. Um, I have a whole bunch of prime lenses, uh, and what that means is, uh, forgive me for people that know a lot about photography, I'm going to kind of give a, a basic one-on-one on photography. So. Some of you guys probably know a lot of this stuff, some of you don't, but um, anyway, I have prime lenses, so what that means is it's not a zoom lens. You gotta use your feet, which is, uh, could be a little, trouble, uh, a little problematic if you are into air show photography and videography. I'm not big into air shows. Um, I went to my first air show last year and I brought this thing, which is a 400 millimeter, 2.8, and I'll talk about those numbers in a little bit. But uh, basically, it's, it's a this is like a zoom lens, or not a zoom lens, it's like a, it's a telephoto lens that you would see someone using at like an MLB game or an NFL game. So it's got a lot of reach, uh, but not a lot of flexibility. And same thing with this gigantic, this thing's uh, 600 millimeters, and then this little guy here is a 200 millimeter F2. So these are, these are great lenses um, because they're, the clarity, the resolution is fantastic. But as far as air shows go, it's, it's not very good. Um, and the reason being is number one, you have really fast moving airplanes. And I learned the hard way that it's very tricky to first find an airplane and then track it. Um, I used this and there was a bunch of guys there and, I'm, and I couldn't find the airplane because they're moving fast, right? And you know, you're shooting up in the sky so you have no frame of reference. Um, so you're just kind of pointing the camera and hoping to get something in focus. Uh, and everyone was like, oh, let me see the shots you got, let me see the videos, and, and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, hang on, let me, let me, uh, you know, let me, let me clean it up first, but the truth of the matter was I, I didn't have a single shot uh, of most of the airplanes until about halfway through the, the air show, because I just couldn't find the airplanes. Uh, it was really embarrassing, really difficult, um, but that's the problem with these lenses, unless you obviously have a lot of practice. Uh, I, I did not. And I'm not the world's uh, sharpest tool in the shed, so it was, it was tough for me. I did get a couple good shots, but um, again, if you're into, or if you wanna do uh, air show photography, these are definitely not the lenses that you want. You want a zoom lens like a 70 to 300, or I think Sigma, or all the camera brands have uh, like a 200 to 600, I guess, because um, it's a lot easier. You zoom out, you have this, you know, this wide field of view, and then you can zoom in and track on the airplane. Uh, these, you cannot do that. But for the type of photography and videography that I like to do, which if you guys have seen on my Instagram, um, it's stationary. I set it up on a tripod. I, I know where the airplane is going to be landing. So it's a lot easier. Uh um, and you're probably asking why would I have these lenses if they're not very flexible? Well, the reason being is because the prime lenses are usually uh, optically superior than zoom lenses, and they have what's called a constant aperture. So think of aperture as like your eyeballs. When it's really dark out, you know, your pupils open really wide to gather as much light as possible, um, and that's what these lenses do, so you could shoot in really low light. This one here is an f2.8. Uh, the 600 millimeter is an f4. Uh, usually the zoom lenses, if you get like a so 100 to 400 millimeter that zooms, you'll get like a 5.6 aperture, which isn't bad if you're doing air shows because it's super bright, right? You have a ton of light. But in the early morning stuff, the golden hour stuff, which if you've watched my last video, golden hour is, uh, it's an hour, you know, the sun sets, or the sun rises, you have an hour, and then an hour before the sun sets, you've got that really nice soft uh, lighting. So the aperture, um, you'll hear someone reference it, you know, why shoot, I shoot wide open. So that's the aperture, uh, the largest aperture in the, in the lens. In this case, it's 2.8. Um, this is an 85 millimeter, 1.8. I'm filming with a 50 millimeter, 1.2. So it lets in a lot of light, which is great. Um, and the other thing that it does, which is my personal favorite, is it, the, the, which uh, it kind of blows out the background. The background becomes really, really blurry. Um, and they call that bokeh, which I think in Japanese it, it means, um, you know, out of focus. So the out of focus area is really kind of, you know, blown out, buttery smooth, creamy. Uh, and that's nice because it really isolates the subject. You've seen a lot of my videos. You'll see the airplane in focus and then everything else will be kind of blown out. 
um, and that's what I really like. You'll see some of these other videos. You'll see the airplane, it's, it's really sharp, but so is everything else in the background, and it's kind of distracting. You'll see you know, cars in the parking lot that are really sharp, and people, and fences, and all that stuff, and that's really not, that's really not all that pleasing. Um, so you wanna have, you know, I wanna have the airplane to focus and everything kind of blown out, out of focus, so you really focus your attention on, on, the, uh, on the subject. Now obviously, uh, that comes at a cost. These lenses are incredibly expensive. Um, I used to be a car guy, and if I think some of the first videos I have on, on YouTube, if you scroll all the way down, is me drag racing. And it's similar with airplane parts, pretty much any hobby that we have. It's, you know, my fear is something happens to me and then I, my wife sells my camera equipment for, you know, what I told her I paid for it, right? Because these, this is all really expensive stuff. Um, these are older F-mount lenses. The camera that I have uh, is the Nikon Z9. It's a mirrorless camera. But these, the 600, the 400, and the 200 are all F-mount lenses. Um, reason being is optically they're still great, but they're a fraction of the price. The 400 millimeter for the, for the new Z-mount, the Nikon Z-mount, is like 15 grand. Um, and I think this new is like 12 grand, so I, I bought all of these secondhand, and they're still quite, quite expensive. Um, but when it comes to photography or really anything else, you kind of get what you pay for. Now, as far as photography goes, I talked a little bit about this um, with the action camera stuff, but you know, I'd rather have, uh, there's an old saying in photography, it's you know, professionals worry about money, beginners worry about equipment, and masters worry about light. So really, I would take someone with an iPhone and golden hour lighting is gonna come out with, a, I think, a better picture, a better video than somebody with all this equipment shooting at you know, 12, one o'clock in the afternoon um, and just kind of you know, taking a snapshot rather than have a picture that, let's say, tells a story or someone that uses the rule of thirds. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, the rule of thirds is basically you just take your frame and you, you, you know, you have one, two, three, and then one, two, three, and you kind of take the, uh, the picture, of, let's say the airplane, um, you, know, you have the airplane on one bottom third, scenery in the middle, and then you could have the clouds or something up in the, the sun, you know, lens flare, something like that in the, in the upper left. So that's the, the rule of thirds. So the other thing with the um, Nikon Z9, and this is most mirrorless cameras now, is it shoots uh, 4K, uh, up to 60 frames per second, 3.8K at 120 frames per second, and 8K at 60 frames per second. And you might be wondering, well, what's the point of 8K if most cameras and, and let's say Instagram or uh, YouTube doesn't support 8K? Well, with 8K, you can crop it um, significantly and not really lose any detail. So you always wanna shoot in the highest possible um, resolution and then and crop it if you need to, because that's gonna give you the best quality. And when Instagram or, um, or TikTok or whatever you post your stuff on compresses it, it'll still contain a lot more detail. Um, the big thing about frames per second really comes into, uh, is really um, becomes an issue when you're slowing down or speeding up uh, a video. Um, if you notice, sometimes people slow down videos and it's really choppy. That's because they're probably shooting at 30 frames per second. Um, so it's the super slow motion I shoot at 120 frames per second. Um, this is all stuff you can kind of learn uh, just by Googling. I've kind of self-taught, but just a, a general overview. Uh, frames per second, if you're gonna speed up or slow down, you wanna shoot with the higher uh, frame rate. Uh, the super slow motion, I'll shoot 120 frames per second because it's just a lot more frames that the computer is able to work with when it exports a video. So it's a nice smooth slow motion. as opposed to the super, you know, really choppy. Um, the other time frames per second comes into handy, and I'm sure you guys have all seen this, you'll see an airplane flying, or in a video you'll see the propeller, and it's just, you can see almost every re revolution of the propeller. And, and that's not, in reality, that's not how our eyes see a propeller. You wanna see the prop blur.
Um, and that is also uh, a frames per second thing. So you want the frames per second to be uh, slow. So let's say 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second. So you'll see pictures of airplanes, let's say a Mustang and it's, you know, flyby and the propeller is kind of frozen. Yeah, the airplane's in focus, but the propeller is uh, frozen and that's not really how our eyes see the airplane and it doesn't really look like the airplane's flying. It looks like it's hanging on a string. So what you have to do to fix that and get the prop blur is, show, is slow down the shutter speed. Um, so let's say 1 30th of a second, 60th of a second. Now the trick there is any camera shake, the airplane's not going to be in focus. So it, it takes a bit of skill and a bit of practice to get you know, the airplane in focus as well as the prop blur. And you'll see you know, the, the professional photographers, the ones you'll see in magazines, uh, the print media, that stuff. Airplane's in focus and the prop is blurred. So that's, that's a, a bit of a learned skill. Um, the other reason why I like to use the telephoto stuff um, is the compression that you get. So you get 400 millimeter, 600 millimeter. Yeah, you have to stand really far back, but it takes the, the foreground, the background, and the subject, which is in this case the airplane, and it compresses it all. And that gives it a really cool, unique um, perspective as opposed to say, you know, even an 85 millimeter or 50 millimeter where it just kind of looks like a snapshot. So I like to be really far back, use um, a long focal length so it really compresses everything. Uh, and then again, because it's a F2.8 or F4 in this case, it kind of blurs the background and really isolates the subject. Um, so that's what I like to do. Uh, the only thing, the other issue is because it's such a, let's say you have 2.8, or the lens that I'm shooting the video with, it's a 1.2. So you have a really shallow depth of field. So what that means is, yeah, the background's gonna be blown out, but there is also a good chance that if you don't hit the focus point perfectly, um, it's gonna be out of focus because there's, there's a razor thin area that's gonna be in focus. Um, so that's, that's one of the things you gotta look out for, where if you shoot at uh, F4, F8, uh, and higher, everything's pretty much in focus, but you're not gonna have that much of a, of a blurry background. So unfortunately, um, like everything in life, there's, there's a bit of a compromise. Uh, and if you're shooting, if you want the background blown out, but it's super bright out, and again, the aperture is the opening, right? You, it lets in all of this light, but it's super bright out. Well, isn't the photograph or the video gonna be overexposed? Well, it is, but then you can use um, what's called a neutral density filter, which is just tinted glass you could put on the outside um, in front of the camera lens or on these long telephoto ones, it's a drop-in filter. And what that does is it reduces the amount of light that's, that's in there, but you could still keep it wide open at say 2.8. So it allows you to have that, um, the creamy bokeh, all that stuff without it, the, the um, photograph or the video being super overexposed. And all of these uh, principles, all of these rules uh, are the same with the drone that I use. Uh, this little, I use a DJI Mavic 3. Again, this has things where you could actually put on filters uh, as well. This has an ND filter that I use religiously. Um, there's different, there's ND 16, 32, 64, but you just snap that in place. Um, I'm not gonna get into the drone stuff too much. Just think of it as a flying camera because it is, so all the same rules apply as far as photography goes. But if you're gonna photograph airplanes or be around an airport with, with drones, do yourself a favor and make yourself really familiar with the, the part 107 rules and all that stuff that goes into that because you could really get yourself in trouble. Um, quick story, I used this multiple times, but I used it one time uh, to, to get a video of my cub slipping. I had my friend come out, um, certified drone guy, took a video of it, and I posted it online because I had a question about something about the frame rate. It looked like it was choppy or it was skipping, so I posted it on a drone Facebook group. And then uh, someone had made a comment that you shouldn't fly drones near airplanes because the pilot, you know, because it's gonna hit the drone. And I made a joke saying that, well, I was the pilot of both, so I knew where the drone was. Ha ha ha, funny joke, right? Well. You know, I thought it was funny. They did not think it was funny. They sent an email to my airline uh, safety department and said, hey, you have a pilot that's flying an airplane and a drone recklessly. My airline then forwarded it to the FAA and I got a phone call from a local Philly uh, inspector and I thought it was a joke. And he said, hey, I'm so-and-so from the Philly FISDO. Uh, 
you know, before we talk, I want to send you over the Pilot Bill of Rights and the official complaint, um, and then I'll call you back once you've read that. And that was, that was, that was not fun at all. Um, so I opened up the email, and the complaint was operating a drone from a moving uh, aircraft, which obviously you're not allowed to do. Um, and I'm not that coordinated, so obviously I couldn't do that. But anyway, the FAA, I come to find out, has to, every complaint they get, they have to do uh, an investigation and follow through with it. So I talked to them about it, and it was, it was a, you know, in, in all fairness to the FAA, it was a productive conversation. Um, he wasn't out to get me, he just wanted to know, hey, this was the complaint, kind of talk to me a little bit about how you do it, um, what happened, um, so on and so forth. And it, case closed, no big deal. But just be really careful what you post online and how you get your videos because there is someone out there, I promise you, there's someone out there that's gonna be annoyed or that's gonna be the hero and complain and it can come back to you. Um, and if I didn't have you know, my, my drone license, if I didn't know what I was talking about and, or something happened, it, you know, it's out there online, which as everybody knows, it's, it's out there forever and it could come back to, to bite you. And I also learned that Operating a drone um, carelessly or recklessly would have an effect on my ATP, which is how I make a living, how my family, uh, you know, how my family survives, right? It's about my income. So, you know, if you're a pilot that flies professionally, don't think that the drone stuff can't carry over because from what I was told, it can. Um, so eye-opening, slightly terrifying, but just a warning, and I know I'm kind of ranting here, but just a warning, you know, be careful what you post or make sure you're posting stuff legally um, because there are people watching and there are people that, that will send it to the FAA. So um, just one of those things. But again, same rules apply for the big cameras with the drone, all the same you know, frame rates, all that stuff um, is the same with the drones. And like the drones, uh, you could change with this drone anyway, you can change the uh, f-stop, which is the aperture, you can change the shutter speed, and you could change the ISO, which I didn't talk about, and I'm kind of jumping around, but um, if I learn photography via Google, you guys can too. These are just some topics that I think you should, you should read up on, but um, the ISO, and with that, the ISO basically is the sensitivity. Um, my camera can go as low as, I think the native ISO is uh, 64, all the way up to, I don't know, let's say 32,000. So it becomes really sensitive the higher the ISO is, but you do introduce a lot of what's called noise, and that's basically um, static, and you'll see that. And I'll, I'll show you examples of, of ISO and, and that, you know, the noise that it can create. But it, it does come in handy if you're shooting in really low light and you don't have a lens that, that shoots at, let's say, 2.8, and you can crank up the ISO. Um, and then the other filter you could, you could put on besides the ND filter, you can stack filters, you can have an ND filter, and then what I like to use is a polarizing filter, which if you guys have sunglasses, you know, you know polarizing filter cuts down on the reflection. Um, and that's good because it helps with the colors a little bit as well, it's a little saturated. But the big thing with the, um, the polarizing filter is one, it cuts down on the reflection of let's say the windscreen of the airplane so you can see the pilot inside. But also, this, you'll notice the sky doesn't have that kind of gray, pale blue haze. It's got a rich blue when, when you're shooting with a polarizing filter, depending on where the sun is. Um, so that becomes really helpful. And maybe you don't want a full-blown ND filter, but you want to cut down the light just a little bit, then you can, you can use this. Um, also, with these lenses, these, you know, half of the lenses are the actual hood. But this lens weighs like 12 pounds. Here's the lens itself, and here's the hood. Um, this is the 400 2.8 again, and then this is the 600, which is actually lighter, lighter than this. And the reason why they're so heavy is just because there's a whole bunch of glass elements, um, but that's what makes them so sharp. Also, um, some of the shots you'll see, you know, like a walking shot that's super smooth. Uh, and if you're wondering how people get that, that is with a gimbal. Um, these aren't too expensive. They, there's a little bit of a learning curve with them, but essentially you put the camera on here. You can't use these lenses because they're obviously, they're too big, but like with an 85 millimeter, put the camera, the lens on here, and it's a stabilized gimbal. So when you're walking around, it just stabilizes it. So you have a nice smooth shot. You know, like I said, I have a Nikon Z9 that shoots 8K. There's 
people that have Canons, that have Sonys, it doesn't it doesn't really make a difference. I think I think the one exception is you probably want to get a camera that has at least 4K. Um, I don't think you need 8K. If it has 8K, great. Um, but if someone's going to spend money on something, I would rather them spend money on the lenses than on the camera body. But I do think you should at least try to get a, a camera that shoots a 4K video. Uh, in photography, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I feel like I'm more of a, a video person. Um, and what's also nice about 8K is you could take a screenshot from a video and it will look just, the, you know, have the resolution and the quality of a, of a, of a still picture, which is, which is kind of awesome too. So I want to also invest in a good tripod. I had a pretty cheap uh, tripod, which I'm actually using now. Um, and I would set up the camera with these heavy lenses. And if there's any wind, I mean, you would just, it would kind of vibrate a little bit and it would shake. Um, so I got a much more expensive, but uh, much more uh, sturdy carbon fiber tripod which is great because if you're going to have a couple grand on a tripod, you don't want the, uh, to have a $200 tripod and, and not only have a shaky shot, but have the camera fall off or something like that. So um, that's what I did. I also have a, a gimbal head. It just makes it a little easier to, to balance the camera and, and get a shot. So all this stuff is pretty expensive. Um, but if you have kids, just tell your wife that you got all this stuff to take pictures of your kids playing soccer and that, that should help, help the, the blow. Um, but you know, also what's really cool about this stuff is, you know, if you buy it used, like I bought, I didn't buy my camera used, but I bought these telephoto lenses used, is if you buy them used, they don't take too much of a hit. You can use them for a couple of years and sell them for, for close to what you paid for them. Um, so that's good. But again, and I kind of say this a lot, um, don't worry about the equipment that you're shooting with. Just if you're going to worry about anything, worry about the lighting and, and just go out and shoot at that golden hour and just try different things. And if you don't think your picture or video is good enough, I mean, just put it out there anyway. Just let, let somebody else uh, see it and, and hopefully pique their interest. Um, that's pretty much all I got. Uh, this is, again, this is not too much of an in-depth review, but it's just the stuff that I use for most of my pictures and videos. Um, this, again, the 400 2.8 is my absolute favorite lens. Um, and you can also get these things called uh, teleconverters, which you put on here. Uh, and it extends the range. So they have like 1.4 teleconverters, 1.6, and then two. Um, I wouldn't use anything more than, than the 1.6. Once you get to two, you lose a little bit of that quality. And you also, this no longer becomes an F2.8. It becomes an F, I don't know, four something, whatever it is. Um, so not that big of a deal, but it is just something to, to consider. Um, also, you know, the, the best camera is the camera that's in your hand, right? The iPhones now, I mean, they shoot 4K video. Um, they, sh you know, high high enough megapixels to, to crop photos. So really, don't think because you don't have this, quite frankly, ridiculous camera setup that you can't, you know, create nice pictures, nice videos, um, content, if you will. It sounds like a horrible word. I know it's right in line with influencer, but um, just because you don't have this stuff doesn't mean you shouldn't go out there and post stuff because, you know. You'll post a video, or the hope is you post a video, you post a picture, and someone out there on social media will see it, and it might kind of pique their interest into, into flying airplanes. And that's kind of the whole purpose of this, right, is to kind of spread the joy uh, of, of airplane ownership and just being a pilot and flying around. So the more people that post stuff, the, the higher likelihood of somebody seeing it and, and hopefully getting interested in, in aviation. That's all I got. Um, any questions about my lenses, my gear, the drone stuff, um, shoot me a message and I'm happy to, happy to help answer. All right, thanks.